This is Mitzvah 153. It goes, that is, that he commanded us to sanctify the months in other versions and to calculate the months and years. Um, so I guess these are two different texts, but um, months and years. And that is the commandment of sanctifying the month. And that is that his God, may he be exalted saying, this month shall mark for you the beginning of the months. And the explanation comes and tells us that this testimony is given over to them, meaning that this commandment is not given over to each and every individual, like Shabbos, toward the Shabbos of creation, towards which every individual counts six days and rest on the seventh. Here, it is not that when each and every individual sees the new moon, he determines that today is Rosh Chodesh, the first of the month or that he should count some Torah matter and establish the new month or look into the lateness of the spring or something else that is fitting to observe and add a month. Rather, this commandment is always only to be done by the high court and only in the land of Israel. The sighting of the new moon has therefore been annulled for us today with the absence of the high court just like the offering of sacrifices has been annulled with the absence of the temple. And they, all right, so let's just pause here before we go into this next part. So first of all, it's sort of interesting that this mitzvah come up so late in his counting and he, he is not counting mitzvot according to the way they appear in the Torah he has his own way of sort of grouping mitzvot and presenting them like we just saw. He, he puts the form mitzvahs that are connected to checking the signs for kosher species. He puts them together. So he, he tends to sort of group mitzvahs together, but also his choice of when and how to present them is not as they unfold in the Torah. This is actually the first mitzvah that is commanded to the Jewish people as a nation. Um, this month is for you, the first of the months. Um, and it's often highlighted as such, as the first mitzvah that's commanded to the Jewish people as a nation. The Rambam himself, in, in more than one place, makes the point that ultimately our mitzvah observance is not um, simply any commandment that was given to mankind, but is specific to what we call the Torah, the unfolding of the Torah, which begins at Sinai with the 10 statements and, the, and then the unfolding of the details as they happen in, you know, right afterwards, and they continue to happen throughout the Torah, that is the source of mitzvot and commandments. If something was not from that time going forward, it's not a unique application of the Jewish people. Now, it's possible, and it does happen on several occasions, on at least three occasions, that the Torah revisits something that happened earlier. So for instance, circumcision, Brit Milah. So Brit Milah circumcision is commanded to Avraham. Now this is a long time before the events at Sinai. But the Torah reiterates this mitzvah in Leviticus and Vayikra and the Torah portion of Tazria. The Torah reiterates this mitzvah and Many highlight this as an example of had there not been a reiteration of this mitzvah after the Torah was given, it would not be one of our mitzvot. It would not be one of the 613 mitzvot. It would not be one of our mitzvot. It has to be reiterated after Sinai. Now, maybe some of them 
are explained in the oral law more than they are in the written law, but they have to find their source um, in the written law. This is also true of removing the sciatic nerve, the gid hanosha from the from animals uh, before you can eat them uh, as part of kashra's observance. Um, the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply, even though, again, these are primary mitzvot, very much pillars of uh, certainly the bris milah and the, uh, the mitzvah be fruitful and multiply. These are mitzvahs that we consider still, you know, pillars of our mitzvah servants. But had they not been reiterated after Sinai, they would not have qualified as one of the mitzvot. So the Jewish people's, the mitzvot of the Jewish people, I say Sinai, but it really is the, the leaving of Egypt that, that begins it because this mitzvah is actually before, before Sinai. There are a few others before Sinai, but they're all part of what we'll call the, the, the sort of building up towards Sinai and then uh, after Sinai. So these mitzvot that are uh, commanded from this time going forward, they qualify as mitzvot of the Jewish people. Uh, Rashi, uh, at the very beginning, the, the, I think the very first Rashi uh, comment on the Torah, he asks, uh, why doesn't the Torah start from this mitzvah, HaKodesh HaZelachem? This is where the Torah really should begin. If you see the Torah as the um, sort of the teaching compendium of the mitzvot, then the Torah should have started with Achodesh HaZelachem. Why is it that the Torah, begin, which is in the Torah portion of Bo, that's right as we're leaving um, Egypt. So why, why doesn't the Torah start there? Why does the Torah begin with Bereshis, with Genesis? So you, you and uh, he goes on to say that this was, uh, it was just hugely important information that needed to be, that we needed to really solidly absorb before the mitzvahs happen, which is um, the, how important the land of Israel is to us and how clear it is that the land of Israel was meant for the Jewish people. Um, so that needed to be, firmly established as a context for the mitzvot that are going to follow. So, um, but otherwise, as, as the Midrash asks, the Torah should have started from this mitzvah, Zelachem. So every mitzvah matters, every mitzvah is important, but this one has a kind of special place because it's really the, it's the first mitzvah, the first commandment that is given to the Jewish people as a nation. Um, and so besides the details of this mitzvah, there's also why this mitzvah, you know, why of all things should this be the first mitzvah to the Jewish people to get that place? Um, and maybe we'll revisit that at some point. All right, so now there's two, um, in, quote, in, in, in the Hebrew, in the English here, he has the word proclaim, in parentheses, he has in other versions to calculate. So you have three uh, terms, you have sanctify, proclaim, and calculate. So what happened was the, as the new month is approaching, a new moon is the first sliver of the moon that is observable to the human eye, the first sliver of the moon observable to the human eye after what, what is no moon. In other words, you, there's, there's a brief period where you don't see any light of the moon, a brief period. And then there's a first sliver of the moon that shows itself. And again, it, it has to be observed by the naked eye um, and it, it's being observed in Israel. So this phenomenon is, because uh, this would be different depending on where you are on the planet. So this is specifically from Israel. So anywhere in Israel, 
any any Jew could um, become a witness to the new moon once if they do see it. They're meant to make their way to Jerusalem. Now you could imagine that if there are people living uh, a couple days walk from Jerusalem, that they might see it, but they'll think to themselves, somebody else closer has seen it because it would be a big trek for them to to make their way to Jerusalem. But I, it it depended when in history this was happening. But there were times when they were encouraging anybody who saw it to go. And they made all sorts of effort to ease their way so that people would be encouraged to come uh, and uh, to, you know, to represent. But part of the reason for that is it may be clear where you're looking at the moon and it might be cloudy in other parts of the country. And so you might think for sure other people are seeing what you're seeing and they may not be. And it was very important that these witnesses present themselves to the Sanhedrin uh, in order to make this declaration uh, uh, because the Sanhedrin can't declare the new month until witnesses have testified that they've seen the new moon. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, the Sanhedrin was in starting in... Uh, Starting in about around 1,000, somewhere around 1,000, before the Common Era, the Sanhedrin is in Jerusalem, and it is located on the Temple Mount. It, part of it was actually on Temple Mount uh, property. Part of it was a little bit off of Temple Mount property. Uh, you could only be on that part of the Temple Mount property if you were a Kohen who was pure. Um, and there were a lot of members of Sanhedrin that were not Kohenim. So they would have to be in, a, in an adjacent area that wasn't on the Temple Mount area. It does seem like initially a large proportion of the people on the Sanhedrin were Kohenim and Levim. Uh, they are the most likely people to occupy that position because they are not farmers. They're not uh, burdened by, um, you know, hard labor during the day um, in order to in order to to make their living. They're they're provided with gifts from the people, a kind of tax uh, tithes. So that allowed them to develop the kind of scholarship that would be necessary to be on uh, uh, So it would allow them to have the kind of scholarship necessary uh, to, I mean, the time to develop the scholarship necessary to be on the Sun Edwin. The Sanhedrin was 70 members plus a head. So there were, there were really 71 members of the Sanhedrin and it was the high court of Israel. It's, it's, it's a, it functions as a kind of court, a judiciary, but it's also a legislative body. So it, it really combined what we think of in the United States as a, a, a judiciary and legislature. Um, and it had all sorts of functions, but one of them, uh, and this very, not only is it important, but a highly symbolic function was the, they are the ones who are sort of keepers of the calendar. They're the ones who determine when the month begins. There are several months of the year that have holidays in them, um, like the month we just passed, which has Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot in it. And, uh, and there's the month of Nisan, which has uh, Passover in it. There's the month of Sivan that has Shavuot in it. Um, but there are other months, uh, and nowadays we have the month of Kislev that has Hanukkah in it, 
We have, uh, but, but we also have dates that are of legal importance. For instance, in the months of Shvat, you have Tubishvat, which is the opinion of Hillel. That Tubishvat uh, begins as a like uh, the the beginning of a tax season or the end of a tax season uh, when it comes to tithing fruit. So the new year for tithing fruit starts on Tubishvat. Um, there's uh, a the, the beginning of the years for contracts and things like that, that actually happens at the beginning of Nisan. Also, and, and that is usually done by determining the what year it is of the king. So uh, if you want to say in the third year of the king, because that's how you would date uh, contracts, you'd say like in the third year of king, of king David, uh, in such and such month and such and such day. So the, the determination of the year of the king uh, happens on the first day of Nisan. Um, so if the king was king for, let's say, two months and the first day of Nisan came, that now it's called the second year of the king. So there's, there's not just um, kind of religious, um, spiritual um, result of these declarations. There's also legal results when tithes begin how to write contracts, etc. So this was, uh, th th so you'd have these people who'd witness the new moon, they'd proceed to Jerusalem, they'd be sort of vetted, and two of them would be finally chosen, they would present themselves, and they would tell the Sanhedrin that they saw the new moon. And then the Sanhedrin would declare that that day was in fact the first of the month. And then based on that, you'd have the calculations for the kind of things that we're talking about. Now, I, what I am telling you comes from reading the Torah, you know, Tanakh. It comes from reading the Gemara, but there's still a lot of blank spaces um, in this. And I also may be making some mistakes in the details, but this is as best I can express it right now. Um, as the, the Sanhedrin, already had a very good idea when that new moon should be seen because they, they made calculations like um, any other sophisticated civilization uh, during their time, they paid great attention to what was going on in, in, in the heavens, as it were. In other words, they were very, very uh, well versed in the moon's uh, cycles and uh, and uh, in the cycles of the sun and in the seasons. Uh, and they had a fairly sophisticated understanding of how that worked. And were, uh, because of that, we're able to predict fairly accurately when things would happen, what would happen. So they knew when you, were, what, when you could potentially see this first sliver. It's just that they, by, by rule, they would not declare the new moon, or the, in other words, the beginning of the month, until witnesses presented themselves. And, uh, and then only after witnesses presented themselves would they make that, make that declaration. Um, so that's starting in about... 1,000 that the Sanhedrin would have been in Jerusalem. Before then, I don't know where the Sanhedrin was uh, situated before then, but from that time of the Solomon's Temple, you would have it at, uh, in Jerusalem. Then you have um, th that, that temple stands for about 400 years, uh, and then it's destroyed in 586 before the Common Era. And then the second temple begins um, somewhere around 350 before the Common Era. So around 350 before the Common Era, once again, the Sanhedrin is situated in the, um, on the Temple Mount. I don't 
remember what happened in between while they're in exile. Um, but once again, it's in Jerusalem from about 350 until the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Actually, um, several decades before the destruction of the temple, the Sanhedrin already moved. It was no, it was no longer located, so it was close to the 70, but it was several decades before it had already moved. And, uh, and so wherever the Sanhedrin was, that's where they're going to do this. So again, when it was in Jerusalem, witnesses would proceed to Jerusalem. Let's say it was in, uh, on the coast somewhere, or let's say it was in Tiberias, in Tiberia, where, which was the last place it was. So then the witnesses would go to there. That would be where they would travel to uh, in order to declare the new moon. The declaration of the new moon continued to happen even after the destruction of the second temple. It continued to happen up until like in the late 300s of the common era. It continued to happen based on eyewitness reports to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, I think Hillel Hakotan, they call him, Hillel the, the small or whatever, the, he was a descendant of the original Hillel, but they make that distinction so we don't get mixed up of who we're talking about. So Hillel, he, during his time, he makes the distinction, the decision that from then on, we are not going to rely on eyewitness testimony to declare the new moon, but we are going to use a calendar. And they, they, def they, they, uh, they had a, actually a very sophisticated calendar, <laughs> incredibly sophisticated, almost miraculously sophisticated calendar that they developed um and uh and so from then on you would rely on the calendar exactly what authority they used to do this is a matter of discussion um i it's there are those who characterize it as um still um that the calendar even that the calendar that we use today it is really working as a kind of agent of the Sanhedrin, that the Sanhedrin of those days still lives, as it were, uh, through this calendar. And whenever the new moon is declared, it's still declared based on their authority. Um, something like that. But anyways, uh, from around, the, from the, the later part of the 300s, around 400, the, cal the way new moons are declared is simply uh, by the calendar. Uh, every synagogue um, on the Sabbath before, before uh, that new moon uh, declares what day and what hour and what minute the new moon will first appear. That first sliver of the moon will first appear and then... Um, that's a kind of public announcement of it, but the actual, uh, what, he, what he's calling proclamation here is not that. The, what he's calling proclamation is when they actually proclaim it on the day at the moment, after they've seen the witnesses, they actually proclaimed it on the moment. So that uh, proclaiming of the new moon that happens in synagogue, uh, um, Actually, uh, it's a custom, but it's it's not a fulfillment of what it was that the Sanhedrin was doing. So when the Rambam uh, makes this dis distinction between the new moon and Shabbos, he he's his, his way of distinguishing them is, is that he says that the Shabbos is not Shabbos by declaration of the Sanhedrin. There is no day of the week where the Sanhedrin says such and such day will be Shabbos and then to proclaim Shabbos and then it's Shabbos. Shabbos is um, 
it, it really has two two sanctification features. One is that it is a built-in part of creation. In other words, it's it's built into the kind of cycle of life. The natural cycle of life of the of the world also has the spiritual side to it. And so Shabbos is part of that. Um, but also we do have a mitzvah, Zohar es Yom HaShabbos the Kadcho, remember the Sabbath day and sanctify it. So there actually is a mitzvah to proclaim that it is Shabbos. We fulfill this in Kiddush. That's actually what Kiddush is. Kiddush is a fulfillment of a mitzvah to sanctify the Shabbos. Um, now, you could ask, what is accomplished if anyways it's Shabbos, whether you sanctified it or not? And that puts Shabbos in a kind of interesting place with another mitzvah that we've talked about, which is the mitzvah of firstborn animals, which also is in the same Torah portion where it talks about that the firstborn of, uh, of, of, a, of cattle, uh, in other words, that cow's firstborn, um, is sacred if it's a ma- if it's a male the calf it's sacred and has to be brought to a coin that is also sacred by the very fact of its birth but it, there is a separate mitzvah to sanctify it so that's sort of a interesting kind of uh, a deep mitzvah that needs to be a kind of unpacked what do we accomplish if we are declaring the sanctity of the day um, after it's sanctified anyways. But the Rambam's point is that that's a mitzvah for individuals. Every individual is commanded to sanctify the Shabbos. The, the, but Rosh Chodesh, the sanctified the new moon is, is a mitzvah that is only a given to the Sanhedrin. This is something the Sanhedrin does. So it's sort of interesting that this mitzvah finds itself in the collection of mitzvahs since it's not a mitzvah that everyone has access to. The truth is when you look at this list, you'll see there's other mitzvahs that not everybody has access to. Not everybody's going to be able to perform every one of these mitzvahs. Some of them are for only Kohanim can perform. Some only men can perform. Some only women can perform. So, um, um, you know, some included in these are mitzvah that are related to divorce. Somebody who never got divorced wouldn't be able to perform that. So there, there are all sorts of, if you're doing a Venn, Venn diagram, there's all different little circles. And some places these circles are representing a lot of people, some of them, they're very narrow. This would be one of the very narrow ones, but it's still a mitzvah that is given to the Jewish people and they are acting on behalf of the Jewish people, clearly, when they do this. So in some sense, it's like all of us are doing it through our representatives, the, the Sanhedrin. Um, one other feature of the calendar is what we leap years Uh, we're we're now in a leap year in a jewish leap year and when it comes to with comes to the jewish calendar it's an actual month that's added uh to the calendar and the the primary reason for this is to keep the calendar aligned with the solar year in other words the seasons the season of passover is always the spring. If you have a purely lunar calendar, it loses 11 days from the solar calendar. It loses 11 days every year because there's 354 days in a lunar calendar if you just do, again, just do the moons. Um, the if, if you lose 11 days, so that means you're losing a month every three years. And so after let's say 10 years, you've moved to a completely different season. If you never adjusted, you would, the holiday of Passover would then start to be in, um, 
it would be later and later and later, right? Or earlier and earlier. And earlier. It would be later and later and later. No, how does it work? If I add, if I take away 11 days, so my year is shorter. Yeah, so Passover would be later and later and later. So it would be in the summer, then it would be in the fall, then it would be in the winter. And the Torah identifies Passover as Chodesh Aviv. The, it always has to be in the spring. So in order to make that happen, you have to add days. So the way they do it is, 70, seven times out of every 19 years, seven times out of every 19 years, the, a new month, a, another month is added. And we add it uh, before Passover. So we have two Adars. So for instance, this, this next year, there will be two Adars and Passover will actually be later this year than it usually is because you've uh, you've done that. I think now that I'm thinking about it, that if you the simplest of parts of this thing is tripping off here, but I, I actually think if you hadn't corrected, you'd go the other direction. You'd go earlier and earlier and earlier. That's what would happen. So Passover would go into the winter, then the fall, then the summer, not the other way around. But anyways, you do add a month. And so it's, it's sort of corrected within a couple of weeks. It's always, so Passover is always in the spring and it ends up that Sukkot is always in the, in the fall, in the Northern hemisphere. We're talking about in the Northern uh, hemisphere. Israel actually, when you're living in Israel, there's not a true spring really. Um, it's more like two seasons in Israel but it's the experience of the budding of the trees and seeing the first fruits, the kind of thing that go along with spring, even if the, the temperatures are you know, more summer-like, um, but, uh, but you are seeing, uh, especially when it comes to the fruit on the trees, you're seeing in the beginning of the sprouting of the fruits, you're seeing flowers uh, emerging um, and uh, those are the kind of indications of spring that we're thinking of for, uh, for the Passover celebration. <clears throat> so that was that. And now we're at this point. The commandment is always and only done by the high court and only in the land of Israel. And the sighting of the new moon has therefore been annulled for us today with the absence of the high court, just like the offering of sacrifices has been annulled with the absence of the temple. The heretics called the Karaites have referred to this and erred about it. Now the Karaites began just a couple hundred years before Maimonides in, uh, in the area near Baghdad uh, but they spread, and there were lots of Karaites during the, the, those next couple hundred years. I forgot exactly when they started, around 800 of the Common Era. And, and then they, uh, but they, they became a, a rather large, still a subset of the Jewish people, but a rather large one. Um, so he says, the Karaites have referred to this and aired about it. And this is the principle that even some of the rabbis did not concede and followed them into darkness and the shade. You should know that the calculation that we count with today, through which we know Rosh Chodesh and the holidays, is impossible to do outside the land. You can't do it outside the land of Israel. However, in the absence of the sages in the land of Israel, it is possible for a court that was ordained in the land of Israel to intercalate years and determine months outside of the land like Rabbi Akiva did, as is explained in the Talmud. Yet there is a great and strong question about this. So again, what he's suggesting sounds like what I was mentioning before, which is that this calendar acts as a kind of extension of the Sanhedrin that was in Israel that, um, that sort of um, canonized it. And it has to be that way because only a Sanhedrin in the land of Israel 
can declare the new moon. And it is known that the great court, however, was in the land of Israel and that they were the ones that determined the months and intercalated the years in which were passed on, doing so in their gathering together. And this is one of the great principles of faith. Only those that have a deeper knowledge know it and see it in its place. So apparently the issue with the Karaites was they believed that you cannot declare the new moon. Either you have one or two options. Either you cannot declare it outside of Israel and therefore nobody can declare it if you're outside of Israel. Or you can only calculate or you are allowed to calculate it outside of Israel and you could continue to do so even nowadays. Either way would lead to a change from the way we have it now. It could lead to great chaos because you could have different places that are declaring the moon at different times. And the calendar is this great unifying feature of the Jewish people and that would be lost. The next time we meet, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, do a little more background about the Karaites specifically and then um, a little bit more about the kind of important unifying characteristic that the calendar affords and how, why it was so terribly important for the maintenance of a unified Jewish people, that there be one recognized calendar. All right. Rabbi, well, what would you I like? To, Rabbi, what would you like us to take away from today? Because it seems a lot. I would of like stuff. you to take away that all those details about the calendar that we just discussed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I am grateful uh, for this opportunity to learn with you guys. Our learning has been in the merit of the safe and speedy return of the hostages, the healing of those that were wounded, the comfort for those that are bereaved, the safety of our soldiers and for all the citizens of Israel and non-citizens of Israel, whoever's affected by this um, should be safe and uh, so should we all be well.